Welcome back everyone. I'm Dr. Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com. We're going to talk about lesson 6.4 today. And the primary objective of today's lesson is to talk about the relative reactivity rates of different carbonyl functional groups to a nucleophile attacking the carbonyl carb. Now we're going to talk about seven different carbonyl functional groups that differ on the basis of what that group beside the carbonyl carbon is. Now a couple things that are sort of overarching ideas behind assessing the relative rate of these species to nucleophilic attack. First of all, if I have less electron density or more positive charge on that carbonyl carbon, and we're talking about a nucleophile attacking it, well, more positive charge would attract a nucleophile more strongly. That would be a faster reaction. The other thing we learned about nucleophiles way back when we talked about SN2 reactions is that the nucleophile has an easier time attacking a group that is primary and won't react very well in an SN2 reaction with a carbon that's tertiary. That's because of the steric bulk. The steric encumbrance of more branches coming off of the site you're trying to attack will block the nucleophile from being able to access the carbon. So the bigger the groups are beside the carbonyl carbon, probably the slower that nucleophile will be in trying to attack. The only one of these carbonyl functional groups that's kind of difficult to discuss in these terms is the anhydride. Because you have two carbonyl sites to attack, which kind of doubles the relative ability to attack those sites. So I'm not really going to talk in detail about why the anhydride is the second most reactive. I might as well fill this in and say the most reactive is towards the left hand side of the screen, and the least reactive are those over here on the right hand side of the screen. The acid chloride will be the most reactive. Well, why is that? Well, if we draw an acid chloride down here, all of the carbonyl groups have this polar bond, right? The carbonyl bond. But you put even more positive charge when you have the chlorine. And some people might think and say, well, what about the lone pairs on chlorine? Won't those donate? Well, remember back in section four, where we learned about the electron donating abilities or the electron accepting abilities of different groups. We talked about the fact that chlorine is too large to engage in effective resonance with carbon. So you don't have any electron donicity through resonance, but you do have an electron withdrawing effect. That puts quite a bit of positive charge on that carbon. So that will help the nucleophile attack the acid chloride very quickly. The aldehyde and ketone, one of these has an R group here, and the ketone has a second R group here, but the aldehyde has a little hydrogen. It's just easier in terms of steric repulsion for the nucleophile to get into the less substituted carbon. Just like we learned about for SN2 reactions, faster for less substituted carbons. Now the goal is to get the nucleophile to donate electrons to the carbonyl carbon. So if we then have a carboxylic acid and compare that to say the ketone. Well, the carboxylic acid already has some electron donation to this carbonyl oxygen. Remember, we're trying to do a nucleophilic addition, which would push electron density to the oxygen. So if there's already a force in the compound pushing some electron density on the oxygen, it's harder to push even more additional electron density there. That's why the carboxylic acid is a little less reactive than the ketone. And then if we compare the carboxylic acid to the ester, well, the carboxylic acid just has this little H here. The ester is exactly the same, except it's got an R group which is necessarily bigger than the OH. Kind of the same comparison we made for the ketone aldehyde. Maybe a little less pronounced because this R is a little further away. That's where the ester is a little bit slower than the carboxylic acid. And then we have the amides. If we were to compare an amide which has just little hydrogens to the carboxylic acid which also has just a little hydrogen, and we account for the fact that we have resonance here, that's going to play a role in why the amide is the least reactive. And again, if we compare the amide with two little H's versus R groups, of course, the one with the bigger groups will react more slowly. Now, I just alluded to the fact that this amide has the ability to do resonance donation. It's a lot easier to donate electrons from a nitrogen than an oxygen because the nitrogen is less electronegative than the oxygen. So if we look back, at the carboxylic acid or the ester where the resonance would have to be donation from an oxygen, we can now see why the resonance effect would be stronger in the amides. 
So there's actually a very strong contribution of this resonance contributor to the structure of amides. Amides tend to be planar because you see that the carbon has a trigonal planar geometry in this resonance contributor and the nitrogen has a trigonal planar geometry in this contributor. The resonance hybrid then is partial double bond character at both positions. That means that you have a pretty planar assembly of these atoms that I show here. Another thing that we can think about if we're going to take a carbonyl and do something to it to try to help it become even more reactive to nucleophiles is we can think about what we are trying to cause the carbonyl to do. We're trying to cause it to push a minus charge onto the O. Right, we're trying to do a nucleophilic addition. We can predispose that oxygen to really, really want to have electrons by either protonating it, right? If you react a carbonyl with an acid, H+, plus, you would then protonate it like that. Or you could coordinate the O to a metal. We talked about a lot of organometallic reactions, and I showed you some cases where a lone pair can be pulled towards a metal. Either of those two cases would put a lot of positive charge on the O, which makes it very favorable to have electrons pushed towards that O. So metal ion coordination or using an acid to protonate the O, both great ways to speed up the reactivity of a carbonyl to a nucleophile. We talked about the difference in reactivity of aldehyde versus ketone on the basis of steric bulk. And I just want to show you if we draw out the H atoms that are attached, even for a case where the R groups are kind of small for a ketone versus an aldehyde, if we remember that each pair of electrons in a bond is a pair of electrons, which will repel other electrons nearby, we can kind of see how a nucleophile would have a difficult time getting past all those electrons and getting in there. Carboxylic acid versus ester, it's a little less easy to see if you draw it out like this. If you draw the H way over here and you draw the ester with its R group way over here. Remember these single bonds are actually generally rotating around. So one thing that you can do is think about, well, what if I rotated my R group this way? Right, which is perfectly reasonable way to rotate it as well. Now you can start to see how that might shield the carbonyl carbon, the target, from the nucleophile. All right, so now that in our first few lessons of part six of the book, we've learned how to name carbonyls. We've reviewed how to make carbonyls from alcohols, alkenes, and alkynes. And we previewed the different types of reactions, which I call type A, B, C, and D. And now we've looked at explanations behind the relative reactivity rates of the different carbonyl groups. Now, with all of this knowledge at hand, we can go and start looking at specific reactions of carbonyls and rationalizing and reasoning why they may take place.